From the Center for Investigative Reporting in PRX, this is Reveal. I'm Al Letson. Water flows towards money. It's not water flows downhill. Water flows towards money. And wherever the money is, that's who gets to control it. Take California. Right now, in the middle of a historic drought, thousands of people don't have enough water to take a shower, but an elite few are still bathing in the stuff. Is this 11 million gallons? Yes, in fact, someone in a year used 11.8 million gallons of water at their house. How do they even do that? That's 90 times more than the average household. That's asinine. That is a big lawn. That is some serious grass. We go searching for California's top water users, people wasting millions of gallons in secret. I think it must be real because there's a sprinkler on it. Today on Reveal is America's thirst for water, leaving some out to dry. But first, this news. From the Center for Investigative Reporting in PRX, this is Reveal. I'm Al Letson, and right now, I'd like you to imagine this future. An America where almost all the water in the West has dried up. Overpopulation, climate change, and a lack of future planning have broken the Western states. Thousands die, and society becomes the caste system of those who can afford water and those who cannot. Cities and states take desperate measures to ensure that they control the little water that's left. Las Vegas has a shadowy organization called the Water Knives, vicious enforcers who do whatever it takes from bribes to murder to make sure the city has the water rights it needs to survive. Phoenix, like the rest of Arizona, is fading away. Sandstorms replace the rain, and Texas is completely dry. The roads leading out of the state are filled with thirsty refugees. For sure, the Texans around the pump stank. They stank of fear and stale sweat that are moistened and dried. They stank of clear sack plastic and piss. They stank of one another from lying crammed together like sardines in the plywood ghettos that they'd packed in close to wherever the Red Cross had spiked relief pumps into the ground. This is the world of the water knife a novel by author Paolo Pacicalupi, said sometime in the not-too-distant future, society as we know it has broken down from the lack of water. Paolo says the inspiration for the book came from real life. I was down in uh, Texas in the 2011 drought, and their crops were dying. They were having to put their cattle down because the land couldn't support them. At the same time that everybody's running their air conditioners at max because they're having record numbers of 100-degree days, they're also having a lack of uh, electrical capacity. The thing, though, that really, really struck me was that all of that that was happening there looked very, very much like what climate data tells us Texas's future looks like. I was time traveling. I was having an opportunity to speed into the future and see what reality looks like in the future, and it was scary. In The Water Knife, the theme is inequity, and water is the currency. Water flows towards money. It's not water flows downhill. Water flows towards money. And wherever the money is, that's who gets to control it. That's who will define it. That's who will, will move it successfully. Um, that's who will have ownership over it, and that's who will share it out to others. The Water Knife conjures a dark world of what happens when water stops flowing. In some parts of America, that's already happening. And those are the stories we bring you this hour. So while you listen to the show, I challenge you to not just think about the stories, but also use your imagination. What will all of this look like in the future? Because tomorrow is quickly approaching. We begin in California. The state is in the middle of a historic drought. The governor is calling for everyone to do their part to conserve. Despite all of that, some people are using millions of gallons of water a year. And the thing is, we don't know who they are. Catherine Miskowski set out to find them. I'm in Los Angeles, tooling around with Steve Kasher of LA Insider Tours. Yeah, I think Bel Air has the biggest hedges. Usually Steve takes tourists to Bel Air and Beverly Hills to gawk at the luxury. Oh, right. What you can see of it from the street, that is. Like David Beckham's driveway and a little corner of Tom Cruise's house. A house is probably the wrong word. These are estates mansions, temples to opulence. Some of them are 30,000 square feet. From the street, it's pretty hard to see much, since many are cloistered behind towering gates and hedges. We just passed Madonna's old house, and that was on the market for $25 million. Today, we're not here trolling for celebrities. 
but for extreme water wasters. There's just green everywhere. You would have no idea that you're in California. You have no idea you're in a place that has no rain. <laughs> but finding out exactly who is using that water, or overusing it, is a lot harder than following a star map. Lately, our friend water has felt a little taken for granted. It's time to ask ourselves every time we go to use water, is this good use of our friend? That's comedian Steve Carell. He's getting into the Water Saving plan. Act for the city of Los Angeles. Start with he implores showers. residents to take shorter showers and plant California-friendly California landscapes. landscapes. In other words, say goodbye to green lawns. Let's do this, L.A., but pretty soon, our friend may not stick around. Everyone's being asked to conserve. But what about all these people who just don't? Is anyone trying to stop them? My colleague Lance Williams and I went on a hunt to find out. But first, we needed to know who they were, so we asked the water agencies. But as Lance and I found out, it wasn't that easy. Well, shucks, I think it took weeks. I actually think it took months. Yeah, we did Public Records Act requests and under the state open records law, got negative responses. Their answer? There is no way we're telling you. Not a single agency would cough up the names and how much water they were using. The law allows them to conceal or keep secret utility records, but says they can make them public if that's in the public interest. Nobody thought it was in the public interest. But we didn't give up. We made a whole new round of requests. This time, we just asked for the amount of water the top customers used without the names and addresses. Eight of the biggest agencies did give us information, uh, but 14 others refused even to disclose water usage info with the names and addresses taken out. Well, the most alarming were the agencies that said they didn't know who their biggest users are in the middle of a statewide emergency for lack of water. The trickle of information we did get, those results were pretty eye-popping. All right, so we have this zip code, 94528. That's our producer, Amy Walters. One agency in the San Francisco Bay Area went so far as to share the actual zip codes of their biggest water users. And some people were using plenty. Take the exclusive community of Diablo. A dozen houses there were using over a million gallons a year. One of them used almost three and a half million gallons. That's 26 times what the typical single family home in California used before the drought. And we're gonna try to head over there. Some of the biggest properties were on a private road. To even catch a glimpse of them, we had to take a hike. Seems like we're the highest up on the hill but I'm not sure. That is a big lawn. That is some serious grass. I can't tell if it's real, though. It looks, uh, there. I think it must be real because there's a sprinkler on it. We saw orchards, vineyards, swimming pools, even a man-made waterfall, but there was no way to nail down who the top guzzlers were. It wasn't until we got back to the office that we found out none of those properties were anywhere close to the top. The real water wasters, maybe you've guessed already, are where we started out, in L.A. The worst offender, one house in Bel Air, used 11.8 million gallons of water in a year. That's enough to fill their hot tub about 25,000 times. It's also the same amount of water that 90 families would use. To find out what's going on in L.A., I paid a visit to the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Before you even get inside the building, you walk by this ginormous reflecting pool with water flowing into it. It's so big, gulls are floating on it like it's a lake. I later learned that the pool's part of the building's cooling system, so the agency can't just drain it during the drought to show how responsible they're being. Inside, I met one of LA's top water honchos. Okay, so now we are recording. Live with Marty Adams. Da, 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 da. Hello, how are you? That was good. Um, so could you introduce yourself? I'm Marty Adams. I'm the Senior Assistant General Manager for the Water System at LA Water and Power. In 31 years at the agency, Marty's seen droughts, but none this bad. He is happy to say that residents have responded by conserving. Los Angeles has slashed its water use even more than it's been required to by the state. But what about those mega users? Well, you know, what they're doing on their property, we don't know, but there's nothing wrong with having a large property. I mean, whether it's one large property or 10 properties taking the same space, uh, you know, the issue becomes, are we using water the most efficiently? Are they following the ordinance? And the city's ordinance doesn't go after mega users. Instead, it deals with things considered a waste of water during the drought, like hosing down a driveway 
or watering your lawn in the middle of the day. For that, you can get a ticket for as much as $300 a pop. There's nothing that, that pertains to the actual volume of water. It's all, it's all about following the rules. So basically, people can continue to use as much water as they please, as long as it's not on the wrong day. Some other California water agencies have started imposing fines for using too much water, but not Los Angeles. And those water tickets? So far, no one in all of 90210 has gotten one with a fine in the past year. But David Wilson has. He lives about four miles away from Beverly Hills in a much more modest mid-city neighborhood. I, I was really embarrassed. I met him on his porch. There was no front gate or imposing hedge, much less a Venetian fountain, just a patch of front lawn. He's been fined $600 for runoff and watering on the wrong day of the week. The culprit? Sprinkler malfunction. I was being penalized for, you know, not being a good environmental steward when, you know, we do try very hard to, to be good citizens in that regard. He's even ripped out some of the thirstier plants in his garden and replaced them with succulents. I showed him the list of the biggest residential LA water users by zip code. Is this 11 million gallons? Yes, in fact, someone in a year used 11.8 million gallons of water at their house. How do they even do that? I explained that we don't actually know because these people haven't been fined. While the water agency had to give out David's name and address, these jumbo customers get to remain secret. That's asinine. I mean, these are the people that people should be going after. I, don't, I mean. During the last drought, people did. Let's take a trip back to the early 90s. George Bush was president, the older one. Baseball slugger Mark McGuire was playing for the Oakland A's. We'll get back to him later. And California was in a horrible drought but not everyone was stepping up to conserve. Well, water, water everywhere. That seems to be the feeling of a number of East Bay homeowners who have made the notorious list of the top 100 water consumers in the East Bay. Back Union. then, water use was a matter of public record. So the Oakland Tribune was able to expose the biggest wasters in the area. 21,000 gallons of water. The rice farmer? Wait a minute, is this a rice farmer? Who is this person? Media even called out the super users by name. And that's how we get to Mark McGuire, who was on the list. The scrutiny didn't just expose him and the other big users. The public outcry was so great that the water agency had to change its policies. It ordered top customers to make substantial cutbacks. But this little drought parable is now firmly a relic of the past. In 1997, the state legislature amended the State Public Records Act. They made utility bills secret. That's my colleague Lance Williams again. The push towards privacy happened at the behest of the city of Palo Alto. It's home to many high-profile tech execs down in Silicon Valley. Utility managers there were worried about the privacy of some of those big names. The law did include one provision that said the utilities could make utility data public if they thought it was in the public interest, but as we found out in our reporting, they don't think it is. That's why we can't find out who's using the most water. Unless they're being fined by their water agency, their names are secret. One house using that much water appalls Tracy Quinn. It's shocking. She works on water policy for the Natural Resources Defense Council. When people are, are using millions of gallons of water for their lawn, um, in a few years down the line, if, if this drought hasn't ended, we're going to want that water. The drought is already adding flames to a scorching wildfire season and it's thrown the state's multi-billion dollar agricultural industry into crisis. We're gonna want that water. We're gonna wish we had that water back for our showers, uh, for, for cooking food, um, so for drinking, you know? So I think that it's really important that we think about the way that we're using this shared, precious resource. Which is why I find myself driving around Bel Air, home to that 11.8 million gallon home, with my tour guide, Steve hoping to catch a glimpse of some of this water wasting in action. Like there's gardeners um, hauling dirt. There's some cars. I think this is a back entrance, like a service entrance. This is entrance. a service entrance, yeah. This property is the size of a park and as green as one. Wow, it's also the former TV home to the Beverly Hillbillies. And it's actually in Bel Air, not Beverly Hills. And this is all the same property. Wow, it just goes on and on. The gardener's looking at us with suspicion. Yes. 
And they're shutting the gates. I'll surely close the gate. I'm, yeah. They're <laughs> like, get away. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wanted here. That was Reveal's Catherine Miskowski. She reported that story with Lance Williams and producer Amy Walters. Do you have other questions about the drought that you want us to investigate? Go to revealnews.org slash CA drought and submit questions you want our reporters to investigate. We'll follow up and publish what we find on our website. Again, that's revealnews.org slash CA drought. So we've heard about the haves, but how about the have nots? When we come back, we go to a Texas border town that's been without clean drinking water for 30 years. And sometimes it's gotten pretty ugly. I know it's pretty much excrement that they were giving us in in our water. So, you know, I thought it was pretty disgusting that they were doing that. That's next on Reveal. From the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX, this is Reveal. I'm Al Letson. For most of us in America, we don't even think about clean drinking water. We turn on the tap and it comes out. We tend to think that poor water quality is an issue for other parts of the world. But what if I told you there are communities in the U.S. where water has come out of the tap brown or green? It's got stuff floating in it and it smells bad. If that happened to you, you'd complain, right? You'd expect something to be done about it. But it's not that simple. Take Rio Bravo and El Ceniso, two Texas towns right on the Mexican border. They're home to nearly 10,000 people, and they fought for drinkable tap water for decades. Reveals Nina Satija of our partner, the Texas Tribune, takes a look at what's going on there. To understand just how far Guadalupe Elizondo has come, you have to visit her house. I'm sorry, come in. I didn't Hi. hear. I didn't hear. Uh, oh, that's Guadalupe okay. Elizondo. Great to know. Guadalupe is short with oh, cropped hair and glasses. Nice you. You and when I visited her on a sweltering night in August, oh, okay. she was a great hostess. She offered me peach tea and a grilled cheese while her grandson played on the floor. Did, did you find it? No. It's right there, but you look. So I'm sorry for the mess. Oh, but okay. this, this is where they play. <laughs> they like to be here. So. It's a cozy brick house with three bedrooms. The yard is small but well cared for and dotted with colorful plants. A plastic white flamingo leans on the wall outside. And we like it here. You know, we're, we're glad we came here. 30 years ago, all this was just an empty lot with nothing but a concrete slab. The family had just moved from a housing project in Laredo. They slept outside. We could not afford to make a house. See, that's the thing. We did it ourselves, my husband and my sons-in-law and my brother, little by little. There was no reliable electricity. Hardly any roads. No schools, no stores. And one more thing. When we moved here, they told us the water was not to drink. It was just, uh, you know, to build and for the plants. No drinkable water in Rio Bravo or the neighboring town El Ceniso. In fact, a county engineer told me that back then, their water came directly from the Rio Grande with basically no treatment. That river was so polluted at the time, that a young boy died from swimming in it in 1994. We just knew that we weren't going to drink the, the water. It wasn't, uh, you know, uh, potable, you know, to drink. It's hard to imagine getting used to dirty, undrinkable water coming out of your faucet. But that became a way of life for Guadalupe. She just dealt with it. So we bought uh, bottled water. I would be drinking water from the bottles and we bought the gallon jugs and all that. A few years after Guadalupe moved to Rio Bravo, the community started to fight for basic services. They formed a city government. I became the first mayor of the city. That was in 1989. Guadalupe's house went from a concrete slab to a meeting place. Even today, that's where activists and lawyers get together to strategize. They fought for paved roads, good electricity, and schools. But almost 30 years later, one thing hasn't changed. Do you all remember ever being able to drink the tap water here or feeling comfortable drinking it? No. For 30 years, they've had no clean drinking water. Guadalupe remembers a time when she thought things might get better. It was back in 2006. Webb County opened a new water treatment plant for Rio Bravo and El Ceniso. We were glad, we were happy that that we were gonna have a, a plant. 
It was a very good uh, investment. A $12 million investment. But the tap water was still brown. A guy named Johnny Amaya was in charge at the plant. They took their complaints to him, but people said he didn't listen. You could never talk to the person in charge. And it was like that. And people would, were afraid to go to the plant to complain. It turns out that a lot of the key pieces of equipment at the plant never worked. And a couple of years ago, Guadalupe connected with a new generation of activists. Like usually when I wake up for work, I wake up like at 4.30, 4-ish, more or less. The water has like this smell to it. Carla Temez is a nurse who lives in El Ceniso. She's kind of like a younger version of Guadalupe, who was actually her kindergarten teacher. Carla founded a group called the Committee of United Citizens of El Ceniso. And she's always spoken up about the dirty, smelly tap water. Even the water that we're receiving today and the water that we've been receiving for all of these years, even though it's been dirty, we still pay for it. Um, this past month, I believe we paid like $87 or, you know, close to that amount. Her family had run out of bottled water when I visited, meaning she wouldn't brush her teeth that night. So do you wash these dishes with, um, uh, with the tap water? We try not to. That's why we have them dirty right now, because um, we don't have the, the water to wash them with. Carla was just starting to wonder what could be in the tap water when Guadalupe had all but given up on the problem. But in 2013... Something happened that made them join forces. And I'll tell you my little story about the fishbowl, because that's when I noticed, you know, what was going on. That's Guadalupe again. I had a little uh, fish in a bowl, and then when I opened up the faucet, it was brown. Like, like particles, you could see particles. And, and I changed the water twice, and I was like, I could not believe what I was seeing. Guadalupe was one of many people who went to the plant to try and complain. Carla went one step further. She called the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, who came out to take a look. They couldn't believe what they were seeing either. The water plant was a shambles. Records were missing, equipment had been broken for years, workers wouldn't talk, and the water's turbidity, basically a measure of how cloudy it is, was 50 times higher than the acceptable health standard. Carla got her hands on an email with the results from the water tests. It was a copy, like the scanned paper of the results, and it said that there was E. coli in the water. And what did you think when you saw that? Well, I know what E. coli is. Like most people here, like I would tell them, oh, there's E. coli in our water. They, don't, they didn't really know what it was. But, you know, I know where it comes from. I know where it is. E. coli infections can cause severe or bloody diarrhea or even kidney damage. In this case, it probably came from the untreated sewage that spills into the Rio Grande every day. I know it's pretty much excrement that they were giving us in, in our water. So, you know, I thought it was pretty disgusting that they were doing that. After the E. coli discovery, the state told 10,000 people living in Rio Bravo and El Ceniso they had to boil their tap water. It lasted three weeks. What could I say? I couldn't believe that all that bacteria was there for how long, we don't know. How long had it been? We were drinking it and we would, like, we would get the swimming pool and then the kids would bathe in the swimming pool and all that. But I didn't know uh, that all of that was, was, was in the water. Local TV stations and newspapers covered what was happening. State regulators finally started asking questions and criminal investigators got involved. They started with the man that Guadalupe and Carla had been complaining to for years. Johnny Amaya. I'm not being arrested or anything. No, not at all, sir. Like, again, you're just, we just want to have a, a nice... Can I go in my car? Or no in my car? See, if you want yeah, if you car, can go however you like, sir. No. These are recordings investigators made no, while questioning to... Amaya. And we're wondering if we could schedule uh, an interview with you. Yeah. To get your side of the story. It was Johnny Amaya's job to send a monthly report on water quality to the state. And those reports never mentioned anything about cloudy water or E. coli. That made investigators suspicious. Now is the opportunity, uh, Mr. Amaya, be as forthcoming as possible. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be knocking on your door if we didn't have enough information to, 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 uh, to investigate. While talking to investigators, Amaya said he tried, unsuccessfully, to fix problems at the water plant for years. And I would take my job seriously, and I always have it. We will work at it, work at it, and we will correct it. But investigators didn't believe him. The records that were turned in by you show a pristine 
condition of the facility when otherwise we've already discussed and we've shown to you that that it wasn't and you know that and that is why you're here last fall johnny amaya was arrested for allegedly tampering with government records his trial began in august Isildo Alaniz is the Webb County District Attorney. My motivation and my concern was that uh, human lives were being endangered and being endangered by a governmental department, an agency that was entrusted in, in uh, servicing these people. Johnny Amaya didn't want to be interviewed, but I talked to his lawyer, Fausto Sosa, a few days into the trial. My client, did not, Mr. Amaya, did not temper or physically change anything. You know, we're saying that we didn't physically tamper anything, nothing. We didn't touch anything. Sosa told me his client isn't responsible for all that missing information on the monthly reports. He said other lower level employees were responsible and that Johnny Amaya was being used as a fall guy. The discovery of E. coli was a turning point. Carla's community group kept up the momentum and a group led by Guadalupe joined in. They sued Webb County under the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act last year. The county settled, and now they have to provide information about the water to the community. It's the same information that county officials resisted giving out for years. Guadalupe is running regular meetings where she can demand answers from water plant supervisors. A Spanish translator has to be there too. At the last meeting, she grilled the plant manager on recent violations. Nitrate monitoring must be done at the entry point. That's being done already. Being done. Uh, the county needs to log testing and maintenance uh, generators. Uh, yes, we've started log testing. About 25 people showed up to the meeting, and most of them weren't experts on how a water plant works. They just wanted the plant manager to hear their message. Florencio Quintana, an elderly man, was there along with his wife. In a nutshell, we want better water, whatever happens. Let the county, the city, the feds come. We just want good water. That's all we're asking for. He got up to leave, adding a parting phrase. Clean water. <laughs> A few days after the meeting, the jury came to a verdict in the Johnny Amaya trial. He's the guy accused of hiding problems at the water plant. The verdict? Not guilty. For Guadalupe, it was a blow. Who's guilty then? Nobody? And like I said, the water is still not clean. Children at school, they still don't have clean water. The children at church, we still can't, uh, we don't use the fountain. What do you think you might be able to do? What do you think you're going to do? I have no idea. Well, we were hoping for something good to come out of all this. At, at, at this moment, you know, I'm not too sure. Okay. I don't know where we're going from here. But when I called Carla up about it, she was more optimistic. For her, it's a victory that people are even paying attention to the water. It's an issue that everyone talks about and... Now everyone's, in a way, monitoring, and I feel that that's something that we did because before everybody knew there was something wrong with the water, but, you know, nobody spoke about it. And even after everything that's happened, Guadalupe still has hope. Maybe next year, she said, after 30 years of waiting, we'll be able to drink the water. Maybe next year. That story was from Reveal's Nina Satija of our partner, the Texas Tribune. We've been hearing about water haves and have nots. So what if you have no water, but lots of money? so much money that you can essentially terraform a desert into a farm. That's what reveals Nathan Halverson and Ike Shreese Kandaraja found in the middle of an Arizona desert. 
I see white sands with some scrubby bushes in the desert. And, uh, I don't know, Ike, what is it, like 115 degrees right now? It is sweltering hot. And, uh, just beyond that scrub grass is a gigantic hayfield. And just beyond that are rows and rows and rows of processed golden stacks of hay. Like an entire city of hay. How does this make sense? We're driving with Charlie Havranik in his jacked-up GMC truck with huge tires. Charlie is a real estate agent, a farm consultant, and the kind of guy you want showing you around the desert. Anybody want a bottle of water? I got cold water in that ice chest there. We pull up in front of a farm outside Vicksburg, Arizona. And you're looking at hundreds of thousands of tons of hay waiting for export. It looks like the Fort Knox of stacked hay. And all of that is going to be exported to Saudi Arabia. That's because last year, Saudi Arabia's largest dairy company, Al Marai, bought 9,600 acres or nearly 15 square miles of land in the Arizona desert and converted it into hay fields. Let that sink in for a minute. A dairy based in one desert is growing hay halfway around the world in another desert. And they're able to do it because of groundwater. Lots of it. We pull over next to an electric groundwater pump. The pump is making this high-pitched humming noise. That's the sound of that electric motor turning. It runs a turbine pump down below that lifts the water up. It looks like an oversized fire hydrant sitting on top of a 12-inch metal pipe that goes straight down hundreds of feet to the aquifer below. 16 to 1,700 gallons a minute. The pumps, which are scattered across the fields, are running night and day. So over the course of a year, in an area that normally only gets five inches of rain, they pump up 10 feet of water onto the land. We are basically mining ancient water. This is water that was probably part of, a, of an ancient sea or seepage from rainstorms and accumulation of water over the eons of time. Very productive ground once you've got the water for it. By buying the land instead of just purchasing the hay, Almarai can better control its prices. And this is the most productive ground in the country for growing hay. Unlike in Iowa or Nebraska with their idle winters, in the Arizona desert, you can grow hay all year long, assuming you have the water. Where we're at now is outside of any kind of groundwater pumping regulation, so they're able to pump as much as they can get. Abby York is a land use expert at Arizona State University. She met us at the Saudi's new farm, known by locals as the Vicksburg Ranch. I asked Abby if the groundwater might run out here. There's definitely concern that within a 50 years, few decades, that water levels will have dropped significantly. So if you look at some of the policy reports from the state, that's what they're indicating. That means that within a generation or two, this part of Arizona could go dry. And the Saudi's hay operation just accelerates this problem. Arizona has had groundwater laws since the 1970s, which limit pumping in many parts of the state. But this area, where the Saudis have come, isn't covered by regulators. There's no way that we can change how they're using this land. If there were problems, it would be very difficult to stop. Yeah, so the decisions are wherever the corporate headquarters are, in this case, in another country. If I'm understanding you correctly, the local land use here, the local decisions on how much water to use is actually being made in Riyadh. Yeah, so, right. We were really surprised by this, that in the middle of a drought, an executive halfway around the world is making decisions that might deplete the aquifers here. We wondered if people were flipping out about this. So we went to Kirby's Country Market, just a few miles from the Saudi farm, and we asked locals if they cared that the Saudis were buying land here. No, if whoever they could sell it to, I mean, they're welcome to sell it to whoever they want. If I knew exactly where it's going, that could make a difference to me. Would it make a difference if it was going to Saudi Arabia? No, it wouldn't make any difference to me. If it was going to Saudi Arabia, that'd be fine. 
No, 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 <laughs> don't bother me none. They got to make money, they have to out there to make money, that's what they're for. Are you at all concerned about water? Well, I worry about losing the water, yeah, because the water table goes down every year. And we're afraid we're going to run out of water here one of these days. Saudi Arabia knows what happens if you farm the desert too long. About 30 years ago, the Saudis began digging deep under the sand for something other than oil. You bring in enough dollars and find enough water and you'll grow uh, the desert green until either the dollars become scarce or the water runs out. That's Eli El Hajj. He's a former CEO of a major Saudi bank. He also wrote a critical report about Saudi Arabia's foray into agriculture. He called it camels don't fly, deserts don't bloom. There is no magic in turning the, uh, the desert green. With the groundwater, Saudi Arabia became an agricultural powerhouse. The Saudi desert became the sixth largest exporter of wheat in the world. Eli says exporting crops like wheat and hay is the same thing as exporting water. Agricultural goods are encapsulation of water, virtual water. So why would a country with so little water become the world's sixth biggest exporter of wheat? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> it's, frankly, it's crazy. And time really proved that it was a, uh, a, an insane decision. Saudi Arabia has nearly run out of groundwater. The Saudi government announced that the country's last wheat harvest will be next year. And dairy companies like Al Marai have been told to begin growing nearly all their hay in other places, like Sudan, Ethiopia, Argentina, and Arizona. All of it will get shipped back home to feed their dairy cows. We reached out to Al Marai and the Saudi government for comment on our story, but they declined. Bottom line is that the current generation sucked the aquifers uh, uh, dry to deny future generations of their uh, rightful endowment. Saudi Arabia isn't the only one running low on water. Other countries like China and India are discovering they don't have enough farm water to meet growing demands either. And like the Saudis, they're looking overseas, putting increased strain on the world's water. As Nate and I were driving away from the Saudi farm, we noticed another big farm along the road. The name of it? Aldara. It appears to be another Middle Eastern company has come out here and has started up a huge other hay operation. We pulled in where we saw a line of semis all being filled with hay. So we climbed up to a truck driver's window to talk. Yeah, that makes it a lot easier for us. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hey. Oh, I never get to see inside. This 18-wheeler was being loaded with 44,000 pounds of hay, and he told us it was going to a shipping port in California, and from there, on to China. We went inside the small office and met Nate Melton. He told us a company from the United Arab Emirates bought the farm about two years ago and hired him to manage it. Nate has deep roots here. His family farmed in Arizona for generations, growing melons, cotton, and other crops. You know, I'm, I'm not in the family business no more. This is all corporate farming now, and it's just different. Corporations are shipping crops, virtual water, from one part of the world to another. And the water laws, written decades ago to regulate family farms, are still in place despite the fact the whole world is now coming for this water. You know, if we were going to say we were going to ship hay overseas back then, you would have laughed. But that's what we do and makes money. You know, a lot's changed over the last 10, 15 years. And it's growing. A few miles away, the Saudi company, El Marai, has bought thousands more acres. And it's announced plans to expand into the California desert. As long as there's still water. Yeah, as long as there's still water. That was Reveal's Nathan Halverson and Ike Shris Kandaraja. One place where there's plenty of water is on the East Coast, in New York City. But even there, people are finding the price of water is rising so fast, they're having to make some tough choices. That's when we come back on Reveal from the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX. From the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX, this is Reveal. I'm Al Ledson. 
We started this hour talking about water inequity in the West, where people are dealing with drought and water is running out. But even in areas where there's plenty of water, it can be expensive. New York City gets more than 50 inches of rain and snow a year, but the cost of its water has almost tripled in the past 15 years. Reporters Kat Aaron and Matthew Sherman from public radio station WNYC explain why. Qué lindo este calle. Las flores Maria Munoz and her husband raised three kids in a small condo they bought 20 years ago. It's up the hill from a subway stop in the South Bronx, and I was a little overheated when she let me in. You want water? Uh, yeah, that would be great. Thank you. She handed me an icy bottle of Poland Spring from her freezer. Of all the things to offer water. <laughs> Bottled water is much more expensive than tap water. But for Maria, the bills for tap water have grown out of control. Era incontrolable. Me tiraban biles fuerte, otros más, más medianos, pero siempre mucho. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maria says the rates began to climb about 10 years ago. She's done everything she can think of to cut back. She has a washer dryer in her small kitchen. Before, but now, no use it. Yeah. Because yo tengo miedo ya de usar el agua. But she takes the family's clothes to the laundromat. Porque mejor yo pagar este cora para lavar. She says it's better to pay in quarters than get a bill that she can't predict. Maria's husband used to run a newsstand. Then he got sick. Her family now lives on about $1,400 a month. The mortgage is $565. They pay $175 a month for maintenance and about $100 a month for water. Yes, she's checked her meter to see if her pipes leak. I checked, too. We crowd into the utility closet to verify that, indeed, when the taps are off, the meter doesn't run. Rosa, abrame el agua. Look, no. The only possible culprit we could find was a slow drip in one toilet. No, 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 cuando haga pipi no lo baje ahora. Lo baja después, cuando vuelva otra vez usarlo. She tells her son that when he goes to the bathroom, don't flush it. She'll flush later when she uses it the next time. Maria owns her condo and pays her own water bill, but most New Yorkers rent. High water rates affect them in a different way. Take this five-story building in the Bronx. It was built in the 1920s, and its lobby is adorned with marble trim and mosaic floor tiles. But it's a little grimy. In the 1970s and 80s, it went through some very tough times where it was nearly abandoned. John Riley is with a nonprofit group that operates affordable housing in the Bronx. They took over the building in 1980. The water bills have become, over the years, a much bigger factor in, in the building's finances than they were. They used to be a nuisance tax at first. People didn't even realize you paid for water in New York City, but now you pay big time for water in New York City. John says last year, water bills were more than 10% of this building's income. In some buildings now, we're close to that's what it costs us to put uh, fuel in the building. In New York, landlords in rich neighborhoods often pay a smaller percentage of their rental income for their water than landlords in poor neighborhoods do. One study found that a building on the prosperous Upper East Side that's similar to the five-story one in the Bronx we just looked at spends only 3% of its rental income on water bills. Jim Buckley is from the University Neighborhood Housing Program, which conducted that study. What buildings are paying for, for water in, uh, in the Bronx is substantially higher than, uh, the, than other sections of the city. The reason, Jim says, is that even though rents are lower in poor neighborhoods, each apartment uses more water because more people are squeezing into each unit. And bigger households mean more showers, more cooking, more flushing of toilets. Plus, the cost of water per gallon has tripled over the last 15 years. We looked at the numbers over the past 10 years for New York City rent-regulated buildings. They show that water bills have on average increased faster than the cost of heat, fuel, labor, and even real estate taxes. Jim says that's put nonprofit groups that run their own buildings in a bind. The goal is to try to create larger units, more two-bedroom, three-bedroom units to try to house larger households. And you have more people in the apartments living there year-round uh, and using you know, more water. About 15 years ago, New York City began undertaking major projects, 
like a water treatment facility and a filtration plant, in order to comply with federal clean drinking water mandates. That's why affordable housing advocates say high water rates are unfair to low-income people. Here's John Riley. The real cost to the city that's been escalating is not that water. The real cost that's been escalating are all of the infrastructure that they have to provide to get the water to us. So when somebody needs a pipe on 57th Street, we're paying more, really, for that pipe in the Bronx. The water bills also pay for sewage treatment and for containing stormwater runoff, rain that has nothing to do with these apartment buildings, but runs off the city's streets and parking lots, picking up dirt on the way and polluting the city's rivers and bays. With a few exceptions, the only way the city covers these costs is through the water bills. Operators of those buildings are saying that it's too big a percentage of the budget now has to go for water. So as a result, landlords postpone maintenance. They might paint less often or take a few more years to replace a boiler, raising the risk it could break down in the middle of winter and leave tenants without heat. City officials say they're open to considering ways to reduce the burden on low-income buildings and property owners. Federal regulators like Judith Enk are the ones who prompted all this infrastructure. You know, we're concerned about the impact on low-income New Yorkers with fixed incomes. Enk is the regional administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency for New York and New Jersey. We don't want to see water rates going up, but at the same time, you need to make investments in your drinking water infrastructure or you will pay the price later. People should not get sick from drinking their water. Judith Eng says Congress should give more federal funding to help local water companies make sure their product is safe. In cities around the country, water rates have climbed in recent years, in part because of the federal mandates to overhaul aging sewers and treatment plants. New York's water rates are average, about 1.3 cents a gallon. Back in the Bronx, Maria Munoz's unpaid water bills kept piling up, and she was afraid the city would cut off her water completely. So she entered into a payment plan with the city a couple of years ago, an extra $100 a month to catch up, including 9% interest. But to keep up with those payments and keep her water from being shut off, she fell behind on her mortgage. When we visited her over the summer, she was fighting her lender's attempt to foreclose on her condo. As I left, I complimented Maria on the plants she's growing in a narrow strip of dirt in her front yard. Peonies, ricaito, beans. They were looking a little wilty, though. She told me they only get watered when it rains. Maria's story, at least, has had a happy ending. At the last minute, she was accepted into a state program that helps New Yorkers cope with their mortgages. She's paying off her mortgage and her outstanding water bill. That was Kat Aaron and Matthew Sherman of WNYC. We started this hour in the world of the water knife a dystopian future as envisioned by author Paolo Pacigalupi. In the novel, most of the water in the Western states has run out and humanity struggles to survive. Lucy woke to the sound of rain, a benediction gently pattering. For the first time in more than a year, her body relaxed. The release of tension was so sudden that for a moment she felt as though she were filled with helium, weightless. All her sadness and horror sloughed off her frame like the skin of a snake, too confining and gritted and dry to contain her any longer, and she was rising. She was new and clean and lighter than air, and she sobbed with the release of it. And then she woke fully, and it wasn't rain caressing the windows of her home, but dust, and the weight of her life came crushing down upon her once again. She lay still in bed, trembling with the loss of the dream, blotting away tears. Sand slushed against the glass, a steady etching. In the story, Phoenix is bombarded by sandstorms, and water is even more scarce than it is now. Paolo says while his book is fiction, there are lessons about what shape the future could take. 
I mean, the point of writing these kinds of stories, these terrifying futures, is that you're trying to contextualize our present moment, right? If I can give you the experience of living as a water refugee in the future, and that's frightening enough to you, then the next time you open up the newspaper and you're reading a story about, oh, drought on the Colorado River, or whatever, Lake Mead is low, suddenly you see that photo of Lake Mead. And because you've lived inside of the story of the water knife, suddenly Lake Mead means something to you. I read The Water Knife a couple months ago, before we started working on this show, and it made me think about the issue differently. Because, like in the novel, water has become a currency. And with all currency, there are people who have it and people who don't. For more of what you just heard, plus our latest stories, go to revealnews.org. Join our conversations on Facebook or Twitter. And thanks for listening. Our show was edited by Deb George and produced by Stan Alcorn, Julia B. Chan, Delaney Hall, Peter Hayden, Laura Starcheski, Michael Montgomery, Nina Satija, Ike Shreeskandaraja, and Amy Walters. We had additional editing help from Andy Donahue, Corey McClagan, and David Pastor. Thanks to KQED for the use of their audio from This Week in Northern California. Our lead sound designer and engineer is my man, Mr. J. Breezy, Jim Briggs. Our editorial director is Robert Saladay, and our managing director is Krista Scharfenberg. Suzanne Reaver is our executive editor, and our executive producer is Kevin Sullivan. Support for Reveal is provided by the Reva and David Logan Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Reveal is a co-production of the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX. I'm Al Edson, and remember, there is always more to the story. Hold up. 